Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Tyler Weingarner. Tyler is a maker, video producer, and filmmaker. He's the editor of the weekly video series Maker Update. He's the technical director for the Empire State Maker Fair, and he's the former video director at Maker Media. Hey, Tyler, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Mark? Really good. Thank you. Yeah, it's so wonderful to have you join us, and we're really looking forward to um, the kind of cool tools you have for us. Yeah, so um, the first one I wanted to talk about is, um, and it's funny because we're in the space now of like in the middle of like COVID or ta- kind of at the tail end of COVID. Um, and the first two tools I want to talk about were some of the hardest that I could ever like talk about in casual conversation, but seeing was we've all become more video savvy. These are a lot more normalized for people outside of the video, video production realm. So the first one I w- want to talk about is, um, OBS, which is a, live streaming tool. It's called the the open broadcasting tool. Um, it's an open source um, and freely available tool that's largely used for internet live streaming. Um, but there's a lot of versatility in it that makes it useful for a lot more people than just that. Um, so people will often use this too, if they're doing any live stream to like Twitch or YouTube or Facebook or whatever, they can use this to switch between the camera on them and or capturing from a a game or uh, demonstrating a piece of software or a slide presentation or anything like that. And they can have multiple sources they can switch between. So it's like a nicely presented um, broadcast. Maybe I would sort of describe it as kind of like a control room or a dashboard where you are a producer and you've got, you know, maybe more than one camera or maybe more than one source. Maybe you're coming from a computer or maybe you're coming from a camera. And you are kind of like the person who's sort of um, controlling what is actually going to be seen by the audience. And so you have a little bit of a control room uh, aspect to your screen. Yeah, that's actually a really good analogy for it. Um, But the tool that makes it powerful for a lot of other uses is that you don't just need to broadcast with it. You can also record a video to your local computer. So this is a free and really flexible tool for uh, capturing your desktop or a particular piece of software uh, so that you can use that to give software demos or anything like that. Anytime you want a screen recorder, this is a really, really perfect and really flexible and powerful tool to do that as well. Right. So like cool. say you were a YouTuber and you were wanting to give a little tutorial or something and it involved showing a website and maybe you wanted to, in some ways, manipulate how much of your face is shown versus the screen and you want to have two of them on the one screen and maybe move around that you could use this tool for that as well. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that it doesn't do with regards to if you wanted to use it to demonstrate, say, a piece of software or a, a tools within software is that it doesn't do any like keystroke highlighting. You know, if you want to hit mm-hmm. a hotkey or something mm-hmm. like that. However, you can use third party tools to do that um, so that then you can make those things, those kind of things visible or other other visual touches like. You know, when you click, it actually shows a visual representation of that. Right, or, or or sometimes they highlight or enlarge the cursor so you can see where it's going very easily. Right, 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 right. Does this run on all the different platforms? Windows, it, Linux. Mac. Um, I know it 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 is it is available on all three three of those platforms. It's been a while since I've been on a Mac, and the last time I tried to use it on the Mac, the the development of the Mac version was a little bit further behind. Um, it does work I, on a Mac for sure because I, I I have it. Yeah, I can't speak to if it has the the if the Mac version is is up to date on the feature set as it is on um, on PC and Linux. Um, unfortunately, mm-hmm. because I'm not, I don't presently have access to that platform. But okay, um, but it is available. Yeah. And Kevin, you use it too? Is that it yes, sounds like yes, you know yes. about it? For several weeks, um, Cool Tools, we tried to do some live streaming um, 
we just didn't really have enough of an audience to, it was a good experiment, but we were using it then as um, just to kind of control all the incoming streams and um, if we have any text. So it's, it's a wonderful little, it's like having um, a broadcast studio in your, on your desktop. And um, the fact that it's open source, I think is really valuable as well. Yeah, because of its open source nature, it also has a huge online community around it. Uh, and that community is not only um, helping with troubleshooting or any problems you're having with it, but also developing a number of plugins for it as well. Yeah, that's really cool. So it kind of reminds me of like Audacity for video almost or something. I'm not sure I got deep enough into using Audacity to know how I'd interpret yeah. that that analogy, but I, w I will say, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a little bit. It's it's the real time aspect of it. I think. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, that is different. Audacity the, is like editing. Uh, yeah, yeah. This, audio. this is like you've gotten. Let's say you're you're going to do a show or something, and you've got different people on different windows. You've maybe got some video queued up that you want to run, or maybe you have a screen that you want to show, and, and so you're kind of trying to juggle all these things and have it feed into one stream going out. And so you're kind of controlling what. And, oh, okay, and so it's like that like, guy in the control room you see in there, like yeah. camera one. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, yeah, I, <laughs> I see that. Cool, that sounds great. And it's it's open source, it's free, looks like. Yep. Yeah. Except donations, but that's a really good one. Thanks, Tyler. You're welcome. Um, yeah. The next two is a pair of protocols, and this is getting deeper into the video nerdity, but uh, again, this okay, is- Okay, go deep, we're ready. <laughs> but this is also like tools that I've heard a lot more people using and, and using particularly with OBS to extend the capabilities of it. So the first one we'll talk about is, is NDI. Um, NDI stands for Network Device Interface, and it was originally designed as a- method of connecting cameras to physical camera switchers instead of using the normal um, infrastructure like HDMI cables to connect them. Uh, this is encodes it so that it can be transported over Ethernet, over your local network. Mm. Um, so if you envision in like a TV studio setting, you could have um, a number of cameras in a TV studio and those can all be routed down to the control room just over uh, over a fast uh, like gigabit network. Uh, not very interesting to most normal folks, but the way this protocol works is that you can also use it within your own computer as a sort of virtual video patch panel. So what this means is, say if you're presenting to your team over a Zoom call, you can take all, you can use NDI to take all the output information from OBS that you would normally stream to like you know, YouTube or, or uh, Facebook or Twitch, and then you can feed that into your camera input on Zoom. Oh, okay. So, so this would be a way of kind of like instead of streaming to the streaming, normal streaming services, you're going to stream to a Zoom or some other local or non-streaming um, platform. Exactly. The The way this ends up working is, um, you know how when you're using a video tool like Zoom, you can select, you know, which camera you want to use if you have like multiple webcams or any, any other video sources in there. The NDI output just becomes one of those cameras. Mm, I see. Um, so what that means, I, and of course, you know, within tools like Zoom, you can select different cameras and you can share your screen, but it's kind of a cluggy interface. And when you share your screen, it kind of hijacks the entire screen. It's it's not always the best experience. And this just makes it easier to present like a really seamless and 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 good looking presentation uh, to the rest of your audience or, or whoever you're presenting to on on Zoom or any other video tool. And, and, and how have you been using it yourself? What, what kind of examples are you actually using it for? Um, I have used it quite a bit uh, for stuff like that, um, where I do want to have a more um, information-rich presentation to people I'm, I'm showing stuff off to on, on Zoom. Um, so so in, in, in this example, like maybe you are talking and then you have like a slide presentation that you want to cut in, or what, what, what kinds of things would you want to do? Um, it sometimes it's multiple cameras. Sometimes it's a, a video I want to show. Um, I know that. So last year when I was um, taking up the being the technical director for that Empire State Maker Fair, 
And uh, the rest of the team there was not terribly well versed in live streaming yet. It was a way for me to showcase like here's here's some of the things we'll be capable of doing, you know, with like showing an online schedule and the overlay graphics and, and things to make it more informationally rich and um, just a better presented broadcast. And I was able to show them on our weekly, uh, um, you know, on our weekly production call uh, for the event. Okay, so it's kind of—I don't know if I, this is fair, but it's kind of like an OBS for a Zoom or something like that. Yeah, well, it's basically like a connector between OBS into okay. um, other you know video video calling tools. And this is just again, this is just another uh, bit of software that lives on your laptop or desktop. Is that That's right? correct. Yeah, and the important thing to remember about this is this is strictly for your local network. Now, you could probably. Uh, shuttle this if you had a remote person over a VPN connection, but I don't know because it's a it's a pretty high bandwidth protocol. So uh, I don't know how well that would hold up. I wouldn't recommend it, but technically feasible. And uh, is it also open source and free? It is not open source, um, and un and unfortunately, the 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 pipe dream for me, uh, you it requires a little bit of horsepower to do the encoding into the the NDI protocol. The dream for me would always be like, could I get an NDI encoder on a Raspberry Pi? Because that's a really simple uh, computer, a really simple and really affordable computer that you could attach to a camera and mm. then get a really flexible, um, you know, studio setup. Um, okay. Unfortunately, because it's not open source and because it requires a little bit more horsepower than that, uh, I will have to wait for that dream. <laughs> okay. And, and, and there's like, is there any chance like that OBS would sort of evolve or that there'd be plugins that would do the same thing within OBS? Um, the answer to that is I well, so there are uh, NDI plugins in OBS. Um, however, it's supporting that sort of thing natively. Um, I can't speak to, cause I don't, I don't know how much, how complex the proprietary code in the NDI source is that, that, that's above my knowledge grade. Okay, alrighty, well, fair enough. And you and you, um, there was a second part. There's of a there's a second one of these uh, called SRT, which is a horrible acronym because there's lots of things out in the world, pretty even related to video with that same one. But this this stands for secure reliable transport, and this is similar to NDI. This is a low latency, high bandwidth, point to point streaming protocol so that if you're doing some sort of virtual event um, and you have your talent or presenters in a lot of geographically distribu dis distributed locations, they can send their video feed directly to your computer running OBS so you can switch between them and, and present that stream out to the rest of the world um, and get a much higher quality presentation from them than you would over a video call via like Skype or, or Zoom or any other method you would want to get their video signal from them and get it out into your mm -hmm. switcher and then out to the rest of the world. All right. So, so forgive me for saying this, but I, is, I was just assuming that it would all happen without me having to know about it. Um, <laughs> so this is like one of those things that I just like should just disappear and be built in, but it sounds like it isn't. And so um, you should know about it if you're trying to do that. It actually, this is one of the ones that is um, built into OBS and is, be, is starting to be built into a lot other of other video switching tools similar to OBS. Um, it is it's just a, a little bit lesser known about, um, and it does require a little it, it does require a little bit more uh, networking know how um, to make it work, especially if you're you, you're working on a a network that, you know, like a typical home network where you have the not, you have the local part of your network, which is just, and then you have the single external IP. You need to do some, um, some port forwarding to get the signal into the computer there. Uh, Cause otherwise that signal will get as far as your router and then not know what to do with it from there. Uh, okay. All right. Um, well, thank you for that. So, so I know you have a third tool that's, going in a slightly different direction. Yes, uh, some actual physical tools. Um, so my third tool here is the the small rig 
folding multi-tool. Um, and this is something I wish I had when I was doing a lot more traveling as a, as a video person. Um, uh, because, but even still, even not traveling, it's still an incredibly useful tool to have. So this is your kind of standard folding multi-tool. But the thing I love about it is that it has every tool I need to assemble and disassemble camera gear and nothing really that I don't. There's no, there's no bottle openers. There's no saws. There's no, <laughs> I mean, I guess a knife can be useful in some video applications, mm -hmm. but um, so it has a, a uh, Phillips head screwdriver, um, a large-ish Torx bit, or a T25 Torx bit, um, a 2.5 millimeter hex drive, and then a three, three millimeter, four millimeter hex drive, and then a three sixteenth hex drive. And all these are in kind of a little, like a little smallish Swiss Army knife or smaller kind of case. Exactly. Yeah. And... Uh, the the other really important one is that um, so the the plate that atta that attaches cameras to tripods uh, the screw that holds that in place is typically with a really broad flathead screw that if you use a typical flathead screwdriver most of them will just chew that thing to pieces. Um, actually, a quarter is kind of the what the common ideal tool to use of that. But so this has that same broad. Uh, flathead screwdriver kind of shape that fits perfectly in there and and makes it really an ideal tool for that. So, um, I, right. so so it's, you could think of it as kind of your camera multi tool. Exactly. Yeah. This is this is a multi tool specifically for for people who work with cameras and tripods and need to um, take those apart and attach things to them and and you know basically any kind of camera rigging. This is the ideal multi tool for. Mm -hmm. It cool. just looks really nice too. Yeah. And it's low cost too. Yeah, it's it's Jeez. twenty dollars. And the other nice thing about it is that on one side of the of, on one of the two plates that hold all the tools together, there's a number of threaded holes. And those are designed for those are designed with all the typical diameters and threads um for the common, you know, camera screws that um hold cameras together. So you can use that for temporary storage of screws that you've taken out. Uh, so you don't oh, nice. accidentally misplace them because most of the time when you're working on video gear, you're not, I mean, it's nice if you're be able, being able to do that on a workbench, but if you're on a shoot, you don't have a convenient place to put them. Hmm. Chances are the best place to put them is in your pocket where that's an easy place for them to get lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So there's a quarter 20 um, sockets. Um, wow. That's, that's really neat. And it doesn't look like it's, is it, TSA compliable. It should be TSA compliant because there's no there's no blades no on blades. it. Blades, yeah, you would think. Okay. Although I think sometimes the TSA may get a little bit weird around things like hex wrenches because sometimes they use fasteners on planes that are like that. Um, mm. I don't specifically know the rules around tools like that. Uh, um, okay. I remember specifically it was always about blades and, and things like that. And of course those are, those are not welcome, but. Right. Okay. Well, fantastic. That's really great. So um, tell us about your fourth choice. The last one is, it's probably the tool that if you've ever met me, I've, I've shouted at you before that you should buy one of these. <laughs> Cause this is my favorite tool of probably the last 10 years or so. Uh, so this is the Gerber EAB light. And this is, um, it, it's a really simple tool. It's just a a carrier for utility blades, the trapezoidal utility blades um, that folds up really tiny and it folds up to about just a little bit larger than the blade itself. Uh, so it fits nicely in any pocket. And when you unfold the blade and lock it into place, it feels completely solid. Like, you know how normally the, the carriers for those trapezoidal blades, the blade is kind of held in by held in place by a spring kind of rattles around. Um, this is held in place by a set screw. When you lock the blade, it's absolutely fixed in place. Um, and it just feels like a single solid piece in your hand, uh, which makes it really nice to work with. Um, otherwise, it's really easy to open and close with, with one hand, although it takes a little bit of practice closing it with one hand. You could probably easily uh, catch your finger in there if you're not careful. So a little bit of practice there um, before you start closing it with one hand, uh, especially when you're not looking at it. And it holds just one 
standard size utility blade. That's correct. Yeah, it doesn't have any space for any any spare blades. Um, and the nice thing about it, you know, because when it's folded, it's about three inches long and like at its widest, about an inch and a half wide. It's kind of a, like a teardrop shape almost. Um, it fits perfectly in like the coin pocket of your jeans um, or, you know, you just throw it in the bottom of your pocket and uh, then, you know, it's always there and it doesn't, if it, it, it works well as like an everyday carry sort of blade because you can just toss it in your pants pocket and then, you know, it's not uncomfortable to have it in there, um, but it's always there whenever you need it. Mm. Um, and is the clip on the side, is that retractable or take off, take offable, removable, I guess, or is that just part of the design? Um, it's definitely, I think it's, I think I've never disassembled one of these completely. Mm. I believe that is it's it is a separate piece of metal that's probably spot welded in place. So mm. if you have the gumption to remove it, I'm sure you <laughs> well, could. Well, okay, but I mean, it's it's not normally removable. But no, it's not. You'd, you'd you'd have to put some work into it to remove that. Okay. Unfortunately, it's small size is one of my other draw one of the drawbacks to it as well. In that I have uh, these have gone through the laundry in my pants more times than I care to admit. Um, however, <laughs> it is all constructed from stainless steel so it goes through that pretty pretty elegantly yeah it's a huge advantage because <laughs> <laughs> i have my i have my plastic uh my 99 cent plastic box cutters that i put in all my pants and and they have gone through the wash so but it's sure. plastic so yeah and how much does a pack of replacement blades cost um, do you know offhand i bought a i want to say what well, Okay, so here's the thing to know about this is that the blade, the blade that it comes with, uh, I never thought was very good. I found it was like really dull, and part of the part of the reason why I wanted to get these, I've never been much of a knife guy because I've never wanted to get into knife maintenance. That's just my mm -hmm. laziness in the world. Um, you mean like sharpening them exactly? And so I bought this with like a hundred pack of uh, the same the same style of blade. For I believe like twenty five dollars. Luckily, and they have a they have a hundred pack Craftsman for ten dollars. Yeah, and I think I'm only just starting to run out. Right, I, I think I have like maybe ten left. Right, right, and that's lasted me. Like that's five really years. great. Yeah. So it, in a, in a way, it's like cheaper than the the plastic snap blade knives. Yeah, and it's yeah. more like sustainable because you're not throwing away plastic. Well, yeah, I don't throw like away my plastic ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah although the good. if you're if you're in a situation you know, if you're on a location somewhere you're in a situation where you don't have your your stock of blades the only you know kind of recourse if your blade is too dull to to work safely is assuming you haven't already done this you can uh take it apart take the blade out flip it the other way around and and keep mm -hmm. going yeah oh yeah okay they're two-sided there's two sides to it yeah yeah but if you've already done that and you don't have any spare blades, then you're stuck. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. This is it, 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 this could could persuade me away from my um, plastic box cutters to to this because I like I like the size. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it looks really good. Yeah. It's just super convenient to carry and and uh, you know feels really good in your hand. Even though it's it when it when you unfold it, it has sort of a a kind of rough geometric shape to it. Um, Oh, the other thing that's really nice about this is because the blade is removable. Um, I remember one time I was going to a concert in Sac Sacramento and I had it in my pocket and I didn't realize that they were going to be doing like a weapons check at the, at the door. So I talked to the doorman and I said, Hey, I have this. I'd really like to hang on to it. I'm going to get rid of the blade, took the blade out threw the blade away, showed it to him. And he said, yeah, that's fine. Oh, oh, great. Yeah. Oh, that's a great idea. So you can stick the blade out. Okay. So yeah. if you haven't planned ahead and you were in that situation or, you know, traveling th uh, through the airport, right, right. you know, didn't want to lose it, um, you, that's, you know. Yeah, yeah. That an makes option. Total sense. Je yeah. Jettison the blade and keep the rest of it. Right. Love it. Yeah. All right. Well, well Tyler, um, a couple of things we wanted to talk about before we wrap up. And one is uh, tell us about uh, – your weekly maker show, maker update. Yeah, so this is uh, a show I I get to work on with uh, well another person who's familiar with uh, the Cool Tools audience, uh, Donald Bell. Um, he invited me to start 
helping him edit the show a, a while back. And so he sends, you know, he, he records the show uh, every other week and sends me the video files and I edit it. And what it is, it's, it's a show. It's sort of like a variety show for makers. Um, so there's, it starts off with uh, a project of the week. And then when there's news that's re relevant to makers, um, you know, we go into cover a couple of news segments and then a couple more projects and then like t a few tips and tools. Um, and because the show is presented uh, by DigiKey, uh, at the end of every show, we have something, you know, a piece of a video content um, that's related to DigiKey, something that they produce uh, that we think is is a useful tip or tool or piece of information that um, that we present to, uh, to the audience as well. Um, and I say it's a weekly show. Donald hosts it uh, every other week. And then uh, I also present the show on opposite weeks of him. Occasionally we have guest hosts as well. Uh, like two weeks ago, we had uh, our friend of the show, Sophie Wong presenting it. And uh, I actually am um, in the middle of producing next week's show, uh, which I'll, I'll be presenting. What's the name of the channel? Uh, the, the, all of the videos live on DigiKey's YouTube channel. Okay. Um, but if you search for maker update on YouTube, you'll find a playlist of all of the, uh, episodes. Um, uh, as of last year, we used to do a monthly edition on Adafruit's, uh, channel, and that was a version of maker update, but that was exclusively about, um, Adafruit and Adafruit related mm -hmm. content, you know, their projects, okay. their, their, uh, their tips and tools and things like that. Right. So, so Tyler, you're taking all that experience and um, you're going to start to create some cool tool videos for our channel. Cool tools. That's right. Yeah. Because uh, the, I mean, one of the things I, I love producing uh, content, you know, video content that's relevant to makers. And uh, you guys asked if I would be interested in doing some uh, some tool reviews and tool comparisons and other other kinds of uh, maker related content as we we explore that and I'm I'm really excited to start doing that with you guys. Yeah, so listeners out there, look forward to that on the Cool Tools YouTube channel. Um, and shortly, we'll see some of the other kinds of tools and uh, maker tips that um, Tyler is really interested in. So we're we're looking forward to that. As I'm a fan, I'm a I'm a, I'm a watcher, so I'm looking forward to it. Hey, Tyler, could you give us a hint at what might be coming up in one of the videos that you're going to be doing for us? Um, I have a couple of different ideas for them. Um, I I want to – one of the first videos I want to do is a, a video around a tool called a um, called Safety Wire Pliers. And these are pliers that I first got introduced to them uh, into – I know a bunch of folks who used to be involved in motorcycle racing – um, they're most commonly known for people who are like aircraft mechanics and basically they're for a twisting wire that's used to help secure bolts in high vibration situations. So they, they can't back themselves out, oh, but yeah. in essence, they're a clamping tool, uh, a clamping, a style of clamping plier that has this sort of plunger on the back that when you let the twi the plier spin freely, it introduces a twist on the wire. Um, or a twist on a pair of wires, I should say. Um, so you can easily use them to create, you know, like if you had a, a pair of wires here, you're going to twist together like a, to create your own two conductor wire for like power and ground or like stereo wire or something like that. Uh, you could easily create uh, pairs of twisted wires using this tool. Um, and uh, if that's something that you need, and it's just, it's a, it's a weird, unique tool that I think has a couple of different uses outside of its original intended use um, that I think makers would find interesting. That's yeah, that's really great. Uh, I thought at first when you were describing them that you had in mind, it was my mistake of um, cable cutting uh, pliers. So if you have like a um, stranded, um, like a stranded brake cable, uh, there's kind of like a, a stranded wire or it's like a braided wire that's made up of little tiny wires that are twisted together. And if you try to cut those with any other kind of tool, it just smushes it and frays it. But there's actually something called a cable cutter, which is made for cutting these cables. And it's really the only tool that works. 
Yeah, I'm not I'm not familiar with that one. I mean, there is a there is, like all players, there is a wire cutting tool in there. I don't I don't know that it would be yeah, better, yeah. any no, better it's, for that. It's, it's special because it's it's a circular blade. The blade is sort of concave, or, and, it, and it makes and it cuts it around in a, in a circle without squishing it. And if you've ever tried to cut brake cables on a bicycle or somewhere like that, you'll you'll realize that. Um, as simple as this is, and as specialized as it is, it's one of those kind of tools that you really do need it to do a good job. Sounds cool. I, and another vi video idea I had, and this this might be again dipping into my interest as a as a video nerd, but I kind of wanted to see how a shootout of various brands of gaffer tape would work. Yeah, that's neat. For sure. Yeah, because that would uh, be really good. There's there's some good gaffer tape out there, and there's some bad gaffer tape out there. Yes. And gaffer tape for those um, who are just um, not familiar with it, it's sort of like duct tape and masking tape, but it's like a, it's a specialized version of both of those and can be a substitute for either of those, but um, it has its own qualities, which we'll hear about. Yeah. And Tyler makes his video. All right, Tyler. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing this stuff with us and uh, we can't wait to watch your videos. I can't wait to start making them and I, I can't wait to see, see what people think of them. And uh, yeah. I've got lots of other ideas of stuff I want to talk about and uh, we'll get into that stuff really soon. Hey everybody, it's your host Mark and I wanted to thank you for listening to the Cool Tools show and I also wanted to let you know that we've got a lot more going on at Cool Tools than just this podcast. We also have the Cool Tools website which has a new tool review every day, and you can get there by going to cool-tools.org. We also have four different newsletters that you can subscribe to, and you can subscribe to those from the Cool Tools page. We have this podcast that you're listening to right now. We also have a YouTube channel where we review tools. Check that YouTube channel out by going to youtube.com slash cool tools. And one of the things I'd like to ask you is if you're really enjoying everything that we are producing, Go to our Patreon page and support us there. You can sign up and give us as little as $1 a month, and that would mean a lot to us. The money that we get from Patreon goes towards a lot of things. We transcribe our podcast interviews so that you can read them online. We pay for editing of our podcasts and for our videos. We pay our contributors. We have video production costs. We have equipment costs. We have hosting costs. And the money you give us through Patreon also goes to support Cool Tools Lab. Anything you give is a huge help. And one of the things that we do is if you are a contributor to Patreon, we'll give you a shout out on air. And so I have a few people here to thank this week. Mark Lyonaj, Micah Gates, Monty Zukowski, Patrick James McNally, Robert Cohen, Scott Spence Lloyd, Steve Avery, Steve Golden, Steve Levine, Tom Hess, William Phillips, Aaron Nipper, Durab Patel, Glenn Mercer, Jay Walker, Jeff Bonner, Ryan Jarrell, Pat Daly, Patrick Kennedy, Troy Wallet, Mike Camerate, Nicole Harkin, Tim Youssef, Scott Reed. Thanks all of you for supporting Cool Tools. And if you would like to have a shout out, go over to the Patreon page and sign up. And thanks for listening to the Cool Tools Podcast. We'll see you next week.